Baruch Hashem, first of all, thank you everyone who's been uh, supporting the Kaz match. It's uh, an unbelievable schus. And uh, we, are, we are committed to uh, continue to spread the, the wisdom, the beauty, the majesty of Torah to all of humanity. And the link is at the bottom. So keep, keep it flowing that we can uh, continue to teach and to share. So we're learning a piece now from Rabbi Nachman, Torah Yud, and we began Purim. We began how the entire Torah is connected to Purim. So if you look inside Lakut Maran, Torah Yud, Sif Ches. So it says, So let's talk a little Purim Dik. Who are the heroes of Purim? Mordechai and Esther. And of course, Haman. Haman. It's interesting, Haman is a shtickle hero, because... On Purim, you're supposed to drink Ad the Loya Dabein Or Haman the Boruch Mordechai. So you don't know the difference, the difference between blessed is Haman and cursed is Mordechai. Cursed is Ham, Mordechai, blessed is Haman. Cursed is, what do we say? Blessed is Haman, cursed is Mordechai. You could get to such a level on Purim, you don't know the difference. We're going to have a practical class on how to drink properly on Purim coming up. Because people uh, misunderstand this. It's the most misunderstood day of the entire year. The Emes. And that's very sad because it's the day that has the greatest spiritual potential of the entire year. A person who goes into Purim properly will never be the same person ever again. Ever. You will see yourself become a totally transformed individual. If you get one Purim right. You'll never be the same again. It says that it takes a lot of time to prepare for Purim. The tzaddik can bring a proof for that. How long did Haman prepare to kill all the Jews? Almost a year, right? He started in Nisan, and it came out that he was going to kill them all in Adar. So it says the preparation to do something evil, like kill all the Jews, is almost a year. Certainly the preparation to do something holy needs to be almost a year. Right? You hear the Kabbalah Chaymer? And therefore you need to at least prepare. I usually say that on Motsi Purim, when Purim ends, let's get ready for Purim. You need a whole year to get ready. So now we're down to uh, a week and a half for the holiest day, the biggest day of the entire year. The biggest day of the year. Let's see uh, how Rabbi Nachman guides us a little bit based on this prayer. V'zeh b'chein es Mordechai ve'ester, ve'homam. Bechin is Purim, the idea of Purim. Bechin is Goyrel, Shehipel Haman, Bechin is Oymer Sa'irim. Ki Haman Bechin is Avoidis Elilim. Haman made himself into an idol. And he made people bow down to him. Who refused to bow down to Haman? Mordechai. Loi Zaz Veloi Shtachavit. Mordechai did not move. And did Haman like that? Oh. Oh, he did not appreciate that. That there's one Jew standing by the gate that's not bowing down to him. He could not stand that. We mentioned yesterday that he made a, a embroidery on his, on his outfit of a getchkova, of an idol. And that any time, and you had to bow to him, of course, because he was a high-ranking official. So by bowing to him, you bowed also down to the idol. Because it was right there. And Mordechai did not move, he did not budge. Also, uh, it's brought down that Mordechai, anybody know what shaven he was from? Yeah. Benjamin, excellent. Yamini. He was from the Ish Yamini. He was from Binyamin. And Shevet Binyamin, their Mida is something called Azus to Kedusha. Azus to Kedusha is to be, you can't even translate that. Fiercely stubborn, holy. A fiercely holy, stubborn person. That if something is meaningful, I will not budge. Nothing can stop me if I have to do this. Even if it means I will walk through fire and water to do it, but this will happen. It will happen. Nothing matters. If this is something that means something, fierce stubbornness for holy things. As is the Kedusha. <laughs> Jews are notorious for this. If it has to happen, it will happen. Chutzpah is also a 
bit of a good word also. There's no translation to that. But it basically means the same. We will do things no matter what. If it has to get done, to have chutzpah, to get something done, if it, if it has to be done. If it's meant to be done, if it has to be done. So why is that? So this type of azus was being asked of Mordechai that he had to be able to overcome the gaiva of Haman because Haman said, I'm a god. Everyone has to bow down to me. Which meant that Mordechai in a certain way was angering one of the most powerful people in the kingdom and potentially was you know, politically not doing something so good for the entire nation. But Mordechai said, I'm not getting into any political uh, you know, PC uh, conversations here. If this man is making himself into an idol, I will not budge, I will not bow down to him. Don't give me this, yeah, but maybe you could do it in this way, and I will not budge to him, and I will not give to him that his ideologies are correct, period. You have to be a pretty stubborn person to do that. Because Haman was from the children of Amalek, and Amalek was the El Acher, which is a physical manifestation of the dark side. Another, just taking it even deeper, connection of why, why Mordechai had this power of Az the Kedusha, and why that was so important that he didn't bow down to, Mord- bow down to Haman, is because who else came from the Shevet of Binyamin, who failed when it came to fighting Amalek? Shaul HaMelech, King Saul. King Saul, the first king of Israel, he was from Benjamin. He was charged with doing what? With, with destroying Amalek. Amalek is evil incarnate. Amalek. The Amalek, the nation that cuts off. Like we said, oh, it's still there. You see the Ayin, Malak, he cuts off the Ayin, which is the Gematria Soy, the secrets. He says there's no secrets in the world. There's nothing deeper in the world. Or Am Malak, Am, he's an Am that cuts people off. An Am of Malak, Am Malak. And that tree cone, a nation that just cuts off. Malika means to snap, to cut off. Like we said, Malika, what the coin does with his thumb. Am Molak, the nation that just cuts off people from their spiritual source, from their spiritual destiny, from who they really are. And that's why it says, Am Asher Karcha Baderach, right? That he happened upon us. Karcha, what does Karcha mean? Lashon Mikra, Karcha. It's true, it sounds something like, like Korcha, Karcha, or the Kuf. Asher Karcha Baderach, that he happened upon us. Because what's the whole idea of Amalek? He says everything is happenstance. It's all mikra, right? It's all mikra. It all just... Somebody comes, he says, you know the way that I met my wife? First of all, anytime you want to hear an amazing story and see God's involvement in the world, just sit down a husband and wife and say, tell me to do a... To, she's a nurse, to do her, uh, her nursing test here. Fail by one point came back, went to a whole other job position that allowed her to come back on another trip to go and stay where she didn't get that job to come into another place where she came into the old city where she was the Madricha and the heritage house that I could be here in Eshet that you thought the worst things that were happening become the best things and it's so obvious God is guiding things. But in the world of Mikra, Asher Karach HaBader, Mikra, what does Amalek say? It was chance, you know, come on. That's why it happened. You know, things happen. It's a coincidence. It's a coincidence. You guys mad, you know. It was just, you know, you were in the right place, I guess, at the right time. And so Amalek is anti God. He's the antithesis of God. And Shaul was charged with destroying that force. Did he fully do that? No. What happened? He left the king alive and then he shape shifted. Yeah, there's such a thing. Like that, uh, who's that X Man creature? Whatever her name is. Mystique, shape shifted and went into the cow. There's such a thing, shape shifting, yes. And, uh, and then the seed of Amalek continued, etc. 
Not Pasha. Not Pasha. So did Shaul have the full as the Kedusha that he needed? No, because he had too much compassion. Sometimes compassion, if it's used in the wrong way, can be cruelty. If there's an evil man and you're overly compassionate, I'm not going to, I'm going to give him a fair chance, you know. Even though he's a proven pedophile, he, he must be, he must be locked up forever. No, 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 let's, let's try and let him, you know, reintegrate. That compassion is, 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 is cruel. Because now that person is going to, God forbid, go and do a horrible thing. So compassion, if it's used in the wrong way, well, I, I want to let my kids uh, do whatever they want. Absolutely, no. I'll let them try all sorts of, you know, all sorts of things and substances. And, you know, I'd be cruel if I didn't let them, you know, explore. And No, you're cruel. You're being too, you're being too, uh, too compassionate is cruelty. Without borders, it's not good. So Shaul, again, we can't talk about Shaul HaMelech on his level, but the Torah does bring these things down that we can understand it at our level on some, but not that we understand Shaul HaMelech. King Saul, Saul, on his level, we don't understand that. But the Torah does speak about this. That's why it's always important when, when the Torah says things like, Moshe Rabbeinu hit the rock. And we're thinking, Moshe, what were you thinking? You can't, at his level, what that meant and, 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 and what, what, what it means, the rock, and what, what his chashbaitis were, what it, all of his, he had thousands of calculations in his head of why that was the right thing to do, and then the Kabbalah behind it. But there is something that we can learn for our generation. Or it says by Noach. People sometimes don't talk nicely about Noach. I can't stand it. Noach, no? It says Noach was a tzaddik. So don't be so fast to say, no, yeah, you know, he was a mammon, he didn't daven for his generation, you know, or koirach. Be very careful when you talk about koirach. Not pashat. Koirach was a big person. So we say, yeah, koirach, balmachloikis, it's true. But just be, be, just be careful. You have to realize we don't understand fully. That's why to take the Torah and say, like, you start anthropomorphizing everybody, turning everyone to, like, a, a psychology uh, profile, not so fast. To know these were very exalted people, and be careful. And they went through things to teach us lessons for ourselves that we shouldn't repeat certain things. But be careful not to say, oh, Kairach is this, and Noah is that. And Shaul HaMelach, oh, if he only would have destroyed Amalek and he was too compassionate, Okay, there was something that Chazal pointed out that he didn't use, he was compassion was off, and he let a part of the seed of Amalek continue. But for our purposes, we have to know that he was lacking at his level something called Azaz the Kedusha, this fiery craziness that if Amalek has to be snubbed out, it's over, nothing to talk about. It's over. Did I tell you something? A story that someone came to Bechayim about? This is a, a little bit crazy. I hope it's okay that I say this. There was a man who was, he was driving. Uh, it was late at night. He was driving very quickly. Not so fast, but it was late at night and he was driving down the highway uh, regular. And he went around the corner in fine, fine speed. And then he he came and single lane highway like in the mountains, in the forest. And all of a sudden he heard something hit the car. He thought it was a deer. And he came out and he saw that there was, there was a human being. And he, and he realized that he had, he had killed that person. He hit them with the car. And he, he, he just went white. He was so f scared. He couldn't believe that that happened to him. It was strange that he was also on the highway. It wasn't normal. But he still, you can't get over that. That he hit a human being and that person died. He was a religious man. And they didn't, under, of course, they came and they took the body and, and they, 
he was trying to deal with it. There, there was no case against him because he wasn't, uh, he wasn't culpable for anything. He was driving normally, the speed limit, you know, but his car, the car goes fast. And the person just darted onto the highway. There was no, no way he could have seen that, but his lights were on, everything was fine. But he still, he was troubled by the fact that somehow this happened to him. And he decided he was going to write a letter to Reb Chaim Kanievsky, the greatest rabbi in the world, Reb Chaim, as a way of just processing what had happened that he could derive some, some peace of mind. And he wrote a letter to Reb Chaim and he told the story of what happened. He said, Rebbe, what, what do I do? What do I make of this? And of course, you know, Reb Chaim will write you back. If you write him and ask Rabbi Rasman, he's got a stack of letters of Reb Chaim. Reb Rashman writes to Reb Chaim all the time. He loves it. It's like his, I think his famous pastime in the zero free time that he has. And, and Reb Chaim wrote this, this Jew back a one-word answer, which Reb Chaim, a lot of his letters are one word. The one-word answer to his letter about him grieving, about feeling that he had killed somebody, a one-word letter in Reb Chaim's handwriting, Amalek. Okay, now he was even more confused uh, about what to do, what to make of it. There is a mitzvah to destroy Amalek, it's Parsha Zohar, but we can't do anything about that. Only when the Shiach comes, but he was, he was still disturbed. But when Reb Chaim wrote that, so he, he knew it then. Sometime later, he was still not fully settled, but he just felt bad. He was trying to figure out what that meant. Sometime later, he was moving houses and he went to. Um, a new house came available in the market and he went to go and see this house. It was in another town. And he was going through the basement of the house to see. And he, it looked like he wanted to get the house. And he looked at some of the boxes in the, in the basement of the house. And, and he saw that there just happened to be, it just like popped out at him. There was a few picture frames. And he looked a little bit closely and he saw he almost did a double take and he looked at the picture and he saw that in one of these pictures was actually the person that, that he hit. And the picture was was this high ranking Nazi SS Nazis, Yamach Shaman, Vizikram. And and all of a sudden Reb Chaim's letter came into his And he saw somehow that, I don't know if he bought that house afterwards, but he saw that, that something had happened, and that the tzaddik knew something, and that, that Amalek is something. Now, we can never, you can't do anything about Amalek, you can't go and do anything, but there's, spiritually, this is the week that we destroy Amalek, because Amalek means something spiritually. He means that thing that says there's no God. Just like the Nazis said there's no God. And they, they, they killed, just like Haman. Hitler wanted to do what Haman did. To destroy every single Jew. Now, Haman was even more ambitious. He said one day, Hitler at least knew, like, you know, when they were, when they were in Auschwitz, and they were destroying, they were killing in crematoriums and gas chambers tens of thousands a day. So it was a lot, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't everybody in a day. Amalek is the seed of evil, where there's no God, and there's no, and you can't have compassion for that. There's no such thing as compassion for that type of pure evil, which is the evil of Haman. And to that, Mordechai was the tikkun. Mordechai was the was the fixing that his zaidi Shaul was too nice to Amalek, and therefore Amalek continued. But Mordechai said, "I will not bow down to Haman." 
He was the one point that said, I will have no involvement with Haman whatsoever. Completely removed himself from that. And Mordechai, in the end, Baruch Hashem. But still, the full of Haman is not yet obliterated. We're still working on it. We had a big victory on Purim, but Mashiach is not yet here. Which means that every single year there's the, still there's some Amalek, there's still some coldness, there's still some Mikra, there's still some anti-God that's talking inside of me. There's a little Haman inside of me that's saying, come on, bow down to me. Bow down to me. God wasn't there. He's not, come on, this God stuff. Bow down to me. And you need the Koyach of Mordechai to say, I will not. To be an Aziz to Kedusha. Stubbornly crazy to say that God is real. And I live with God in my life. And your voice, I will never bow down to you. We should be Zeichat to be from the students of Mordechai Manish. And never to bow down to Haman ever.